Uh, hi, I uh, am going to give a talk today called The Future is Beautiful. Um, for people who don't know who I am, I am um, uh, from America. I run a video game studio called Shell Games out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I also teach at Carnegie Mellon University at the Entertainment Technology Center there. And uh, part of the, one of the things I'm going to do while I'm out here is up in Manchester, up at the University of Salford. We're starting to do some work with them. Um, so uh, we've been very excited at the Entertainment Technology Center. Uh, I formerly was the creative director of the Disney Virtual Reality Studio. And I wrote a book called The Art of Game Design. But today I wanted to talk a little bit about the 21st century and how it relates to education. Um, there was a lot of doom and gloom, I think, at the start of the 21st century, all the Y2K fussing and people worrying that things were going to get worse and worse. And now that we're 12 years in, one of the things I can't help but notice is how beautiful everything is getting. Things just seem to be getting more and more beautiful all the time. Even you look at things, something as simple as a, as a toothbrush. I don't know why all my talks start with a toothbrush, but they do. Back in the 1970s, if you wanted to buy a toothbrush, you'd go to the store, there was one shape and three colors, brush your teeth and get out, right? If you go now to buy a toothbrush, it's like a tropical fish aquarium. There's shapes and colors and sizes and textures and patterns, and some of them light up and play music and have characters, and, and they're just getting more interesting and more and more beautiful. And it's not just toothbrushes. This is happening with everything in society. I mean, look at the iPhone. Do people get the iPhone because, wow, it has the best reception of any phone I've ever had? <laughs> no. In fact, that's irrelevant. What it, what, people get it because it's so beautiful to use. They love what it feels like to, to use it. Even Gateshead. Like, I was asked to give a talk up in Gateshead, and I'm like, all right, I think I know what I'm getting into. And I get there, and I see this building, and I'm looking around for the TARDIS, right? This, this building is just unlike anything I'd ever seen. It's absolutely gorgeous, because that's how we do things in the 21st century. We make them beautiful. These buildings here at the bottom, that's how we did it in the 20th century, right? Just bleh, these kind of ugly things that we sort of stick out there. But in the 21st century, we make things beautiful. And there are other trends, too. Another trend I can't help but notice is how customized everything's getting. We certainly see it in the world of video games. It used to be that people, you know, you'd, you'd put Mario in a game and you'd play that character, but not anymore. Kids now expect to be able to create their own character in the game, and they're disappointed if they can't. And this isn't just in, in video games. I don't know if you've ever seen, I don't know if you have this here in the, in the UK, Coke Freestyle. That, that's not a drug reference. It's a real thing. It, the whole idea is you, it's, a, it's a soda machine you have at a fast food restaurant. It has a hundred flavors in it. And you can mix and match them. If you want to make like grape root beer with lemon, you can do that. Um, and, and, and people love it. And M&Ms. It used to be they just all had an M. You could have it upside down and have a W, but that was all you got. <laughs> now you go online, and you can put any message you want on there, or you can put a picture on there. You could be eating your own face right now. <laughs> and so another trend is sharing. It's another wonderful 21st century trend, is how much people love to share. One of the hits in the video game industry is Little Big Planet, a game where, where players can make their own game levels and put them up online and share them with each other. And they've made millions and millions of these, of these different levels. And, and again, this is going everywhere. I remember when I first heard of Wikipedia, I heard about the idea. And I thought, an encyclopedia everyone can edit? That's the worst idea ever. It's going to suffer the tragedy of the commons. It's going to be a mess. It's going to fall apart. It will never be authoritative. And instead, it may be humanity's greatest achievement because people love to share. They love sharing. And then finally, a fourth trend for the 21st century is that people want things to be real. 
I was woken up by this book, Authenticity, by Gilmore and Pine, where they talk about how the most important thing in culture right now for, for any new product or service is how real, how authentic do people perceive it to be. And it's interesting that this is happening now when things are getting so virtual. Why do people want things to be real and genuine? Because we do see it. It used to be television, for example, was all about fiction and fantasy. Now people want reality TV. It used to be you'd go to buy groceries, and now it's organic groceries. I need groceries that are more real. And what they, what they posit is that our disconnect from nature that all of this new technology has caused has given us a hunger to connect to things that are real. And while the disconnect is lamentable, the hunger for reality is something that's exciting. And the fact that people are focusing on it and valuing things that are authentic and real it is an exciting trend. So that all looks pretty good. If this is what the 21st century is about, then we're in pretty good shape. So, and of course in the classroom, right? That's what you see, right? It's, it's beautiful in there, right? No. No, that's, that's not how it is, right? Is it beautiful? No, the classroom is freaking ugly. <laughs> ugly desks, ugly decorations, ugly books, ugly lighting, ugly teachers, and ugly students. <laughs> is it customized? No, of course not. Custom Customization is the enemy. It's standardized. We need standardized testing so we can have standardized schools giving us standardized students with standardized thinking is what the classroom is about. Shared? No. Withheld. Eyes on your own paper, please. No sharing in this classroom. Is it real? What does that mean? What would it mean for a classroom to be real? Well, I think it would mean you have real teachers and real students. What's a real teacher? A real teacher is someone who is an actual expert in what they're talking about and knows how to prepare the students for for the real world. So they're connected with exactly how this knowledge will be used in the real world, and they're a real world expert at it. If you are not doing both of those things, then you are a fake teacher. You are pretending to be an expert, and you are pretending to prepare people for the real world. And how about for students? A real student is someone who wants the knowledge so they can use it to transform themselves and go and accomplish something. A fake student is one who pretends to care because there's some extrinsic reason that they have to care or they're going to suffer. So unfortunately, we have a lot of fake teachers and fake students. So that's not good. That's not really what we're looking for. And why is it that the classroom seems to be somewhat immune from these trends? I think it's partly because we know classrooms in education tend to be slow to adopt new things and to adopt new technologies. Um, television, for example, was invented in the 1940s. Television didn't really start showing up in the classrooms until the 1980s, and I'm still not sure we're using it very well in there. It takes a while to kind of get schools to change. And okay, we could wait, maybe, maybe by the 22nd century, some of these 21st century concepts will start to penetrate in there. But I think there are other things we can do now in order to sort of hasten these, these positive 21st century concepts. So let's start with beauty, the first one. Well, things don't just become beautiful. You don't just wait around and hope they become beautiful. Things become beautiful through design. If we want education to become beautiful, we have to figure out how, what does that mean and how is it possible. One, one small example, a colleague of mine, Lee Sheldon, who was a game designer uh, turned educator, he was shocked when he went to the school and he started looking at the systems and he thought, these systems are broken, right? He, th this is, if I was making a game, I would never reward people this way because you have grade point averages, for example, that go up and down, right? If you get an A on the first test, you have, you have one score, and then I get a C on the second test. Oh, well, now you've gone down to a B. If you're making World of Warcraft, you don't get to level 10, and then get killed by a dragon, and you're like, oh, now I'm level five. 
Game designers would never do that because people hate it, right? And so, so Lee changed it. He said, forget this. I'm throwing this out. And on your first day of class, you show up, and he says, welcome to class. You all have an F. And you have an F because you're level one. And when you do work in the class, you'll get experience points. And when you get enough, you'll work your way up to level two, which is a D minus. And gradually, you'll work your way up until you get to a certain grade. Now, he made a lot of changes in the class, but this was one of the most notable ones. And he found it caused a big difference in the engagement of the students. The students latched on to this notion of being able to make steady progress um, in a way that was, was tangible and made a difference. And in fact, he wrote a book about this and many of the other concepts he introduced called The Multiplayer Classroom. And he collected uh, data from other people who were trying similar experiments. And not that I'm saying that game mechanics are going to be the right way to make your education beautiful, but I'm just pointing out that if you want it to be beautiful, you have to design it. You have to bring something new to the table. So how about customization? Well, one of the interesting things that we've seen, people are probably familiar with this concept of, of the long tail that has come up in recent years. It, it's a counterintuitive concept. So for example, you think about something like Amazon selling books. And you'd think, well, where do they make their money? They probably make their money, most of their money, selling bestsellers. And then they have all these weird little fringy things. And they probably make some money there. But most of it's going to be all that stuff that like everybody buys. The Twilight books and Harry Potter is where they're going to make most of their money. And they'll make a little money on the other stuff. And it turns out it's not true. Over half of the money that Amazon makes comes from selling books not available any, in any retail establishments. And because this little tale of unpopular things is so long that it makes a huge difference um, in, in terms of their sales. And the same thing is true with education. People want to learn about so many different things. People want to customize. And the thing about customizing education, customizing is an act of respect. Uh, at the ETC, we were given a challenge, working with the MacArthur Foundation, to uh, help build this place called uh, U Media in, uh, in Chicago. And the whole notion of U Media was they, they wanted to solve two problems at once. First problem being that the uh, schools are failing at arts education, and especially digital arts education. And second, secondly, the libraries are becoming irrelevant because of the internet. So the thought was, what if the libraries could have a new job? What if they could take on informal digital arts education? And so we uh, looked at this book by, uh, uh, edited by uh, Mimi Iro here, with the, which was based around this concept that teenagers in particular have these sort of three modes of learning. They're referred to as hanging out, very informal, just kind of just barely getting in touch with the material, messing around where they start to explore it in a casual way, and then geeking out where they're really intense. And we ended up, we, we, you know, we, we were convinced that yes, this is the right way to kind of uh, work with teenagers. And so we designed the space to physically represent that. So the way it works at UMedia is teenagers show up, and it's a casual place. If they want to hang out and play video games or listen to music or borrow a laptop and surf the web, they can do all those things right there in the library. It's totally fine. However, there are mentors who are hanging around. And the mentors observe for a while. And when they see someone's interested in something, they'll approach them and say, you know, I see you're really into music. Would you be interested in learning to make your own music? We have everything here. And so they set up systems where, you know, casually they can start kind of playing around with it and then further get deeper and start to have, you know, they have little labs where they can, they can really get into it. And, and it works and it's, it's, made a, it's made a huge difference there. People have talked about the Khan Academy, certainly, and this, using these videos is certainly a mode of being able to customize uh, one's education. And Quest to Learn, people may be familiar with this, Katie Salen's project in New York City, a high school entirely based on a game-based curriculum. Now, most people assume that, oh, that means they're playing video games all the time, and in truth, what they're often doing is creating and designing their own games, many of them physical. And one of the big secrets of Quest to Learn is the games are important, but more important is the emphasis on customization. And I guess I just want to kind of make a side note here about curiosity. Curiosity isn't something we talk about a lot in the schools. There's no tests for curiosity. But here in the 21st century, there, 
curiosity is more important than it has been in the entire whole of human history. Because it used to be a curious kid maybe could learn some stuff. Now we have the entire field of human knowledge, all human knowledge available at the touch of a button, which gives curious children an insane advantage. Anything they'd like to learn about or learn to do, they can do just like that. They can just get in and do it. So what does that mean for the children who aren't curious? They're going to be left so far behind, leaving what I call the curiosity gap. And if this is true, then it may be the most important thing we can do in the entire field of education is figure out whether we can make children more curious. But we don't even talk about this. I'm not even sure we really know. Are children just born more curious or less curious? Or are there things we can do to encourage and enhance their curiosity? It's not in any curriculum that I've ever seen to try and build up a child's curiosity, but it may be the most important thing that we can do. And the one thing I do know is that when you customize education, you are rewarding curiosity. And when you standardize education, you are punishing curiosity. So let's talk about sharing. Sharing doesn't just happen either, right? It, you, you can't just give the same old assignments and, and do education in the same way and hope sharing is going to work. It, as a teacher, you must design it. You have to create situations that demand sharing so that, so that the sharing will come out. One of the ways we do this at the Entertainment Technology Center, where we're trying to teach students of various disciplines how to come together and innovate, is we give them all these crazy technologies that barely work, people barely understand them, we're not quite sure how, you know, uh, what they do or how they should be used, and we put them in situations where they must, uh, in a very short time, build functioning, coherent, interesting, entertaining virtual worlds. And we design the team such that there is a programmer, a, a three-dimensional modeler, a painter, and a sound designer. And we put them all together and we say, you have two weeks, build an amazing virtual world. And the thing about it is none of them can do it alone. With team projects, very often one person leads and everyone else kind of follows. And we create a situation where it's impossible. If any one of them fails, they all fail because the, the whole thing will, will fall apart. And so they learn quickly that they need to come together and work together if they're going to survive. And then finally, the notion of reality. One of my favorite examples in terms of how do you make school more real is Animation Mentor, an online program for teaching animation that has become known as one of the best ways to learn animation. Not some fancy art school that you go to, but a program you do at home. It's quite hard to get into because they're very selective. And what it manages to do is it does a great job of pairing real teachers with real students. When I say real teachers, these are people who have been real 3D computer animators in Hollywood and other places who do uh, teaching remotely, uh, you know, often from their home, so that they, we have these real teachers all over the world. And then real students who are just dying to get into this industry. And they're able to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one critique from the real teachers to the real students. And it's created one of the world's best animation programs, even though it doesn't have a physical location. Another way to consider getting more reality into the classroom is through simulations. Um, we started doing some work with the New York Fire Department, creating simulations to help them uh, simulate, help firefighters better prepare for terrorist attacks which you can imagine is something kind of close to home for them. And as we first started approaching the instructors about this, they were very skeptical. They weren't sure that this was a good idea, that this was what they, uh, they wanted, because they felt like this software was going to come in in an attempt to replace them. You know, and you can imagine these guys, what, are you going to replace me with this? You know, it, and, and, and you know, what do you know? What do you, you academic guys know? You don't know anything about fighting fires. And we're like, yeah, you know, you're right. We really don't. We're trying to learn from you. We're trying to make this useful. And we quickly learned that what we needed to do was figure out what did the instructor need. Instead of how can we replace the instructor, which is what so many educational software designers think about, the question was how can we empower the instructor? 
And as we talk to instructors, the firefighter instructors, they have a huge problem because, you know, I know you guys are bored sitting out here listening to this. Imagine firefighters. They hate being lectured to. They went into firefighting so they could be active and be out there and to sit in a classroom and take notes. They freaking hate it. And so the good instructors, what they do is they paint these pictures of scenarios. Okay, you know, you know there's a three-story warehouse and we've had a report on this side. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? And then the students start getting engaged and talk about what they do. And he kind of, you know, we, and we saw these, these guys effectively being dungeon masters. And we realized, what if we could give them tools so they could be better dungeon masters? And we built this system called Hazmat Hot Zone that was all about, it was an interactive simulation based on kind of a first-person shooter engine running around, you know, inside the building. But we gave a special console to the instructor. The instructor could design a scenario, he could set it up any way he wanted, and he could cause events to happen in the middle of the scenario. Be and uh, when it was working well, what would happen would be we'd set up these scenarios, these guys would be training on it, and what the instructor's on the lookout for is that moment, that teachable moment, right? The thing every good instructor is looking for. They're trying to pry open the mind so that, bam, you can find that moment and get it in there. Because you can give them the advice, but if they're not ready for it, it's not going to stick. But if you create a situation where a group of guys who normally work together on a daily basis, they have to save each other's lives, and if you put them in a simulation where something goes wrong and someone in the simulation is going to die, these guys are like, wait, what did we do wrong? And at that moment, the instructor can pause it and say, this is why you need to use these methods. Let's talk about these methods. Let's do the simulation again. So, this is, I think, a mode you, that it, the more that people can think about instructor as dungeon master, as someone who can contr control the scenario and use software not to replace the instructor, but to make them more powerful, that's where simulations are really going to come into their home in the classroom. Anyway, so just to sum it up here, there's your mission. If you can make education beautiful, customized, shared, and real, then everybody wins. Thank you.